Hi, welcome to Biology 105, Unit 1. Um, every time I do this, I will tell you what unit it is and then go through the notes and uh, at the end, uh, save this and upload it to uh, um, Canvas so you can listen to them. However, once I do that, the links inside the PowerPoints you won't be able to click on once I put them into YouTube. So if there's a link and I don't show it during this slideshow and you're interested in it, please go back to the original PowerPoint in Canvas and check it out. All right, Unit 1, the introduction to 105, is about anatomy and physiology. We're going to talk about the organization, the characteristics and requirements of life, some body systems, and then at the end of the PowerPoint show is a bunch of anatomical terms that is basically your lab. All right, so this is anatomy and physiology. You ought to know what those two words are. Anatomy is basically the study of the parts, and physiology is the study of the function. So all the parts of the car make up the car, and once all the parts are correctly in order, they should function to make that car go. So you're going to learn parts, and you're going to learn how they function together to make you who you are. Obviously, the most common reason to study this is if you want to go into the medical field, you got to know the parts and how they work if you want to be a nurse or a doctor or an ultrasound technician or whatever. Some of you might be taking this class just because you need a science with a lab, which is cool that you picked this one to take because I like teaching it and I love people who want to learn about the human body. Hopefully by the end, even if you don't go into a medical field, you understand a little bit more about how you work and what can go wrong and how to fix it. So the organization of most textbooks and anatomy and physiology follow this um, uh, pyramid-like uh, structure. At the very top, you have atoms and molecules. So unit two, we're gonna talk a little bit about chemistry and how they get together and form larger molecules like fats and carbs and proteins. And then those molecules form organelles, which are functional parts of cells. Organelles uh, make up cells and a group of like cells make up tissues. Okay, so now we're here uh, in the, about the middle of the pyramid. Uh, there's four different kinds of tissues that make up organs. And then there are usually more than one or several organs within an organ system. And there are 11 organ systems. And the first one we're going to talk about in Unit 5 is the skin, for example. And then the 11 organ systems make up us. So the organization of humans, subatomic particles to atoms to molecules to organelles, cells to tissues, tissues to organs, organs to organ systems, which make up humans. And we will be talking about all of these, or pretty much in this order, as we go through this class. So the first organ system that we're going to talk about, and there are 11 here, and you should write down in your notes the name of the organ system, some of the organs, and what it does. So your first quiz, for example, might say which organ system includes the skin, the hair, and the nails, and functions to help regulate body temperature and protect you. And that would be the integumentary system, the first one. The second organ system is the skeletal system. This includes the bones, the cartilage, the joints. It also functions to protect. Um, it supports, we'd look pretty funny if we were boneless. And it allows for movement. It also um, is where your blood cells are made in the red bone marrow. The muscular system obviously includes the muscles, but also the tendons. And the main job of the muscle uh, system, of course, is movement, but it also generates quite a bit of body heat. Number four is the nervous system. This includes the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerves. It functions as a control center. If you want to think of your CPU, that would be your nervous system. It takes sensory information from the outside or the inside of the body to the brain. The brain interprets that and then develops or initiates the response. Number five is the endocrine system. 
that is the glands that secrete hormones, like the pancreas, for example, or the thyroid gland, and it helps maintain homeostasis or balance. And we'll talk about homeostasis here in a few minutes. Number six is the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system really only includes the spleen and the lymph nodes. Um, not very many, not very much anatomy in this one, but it functions to return fluid to the cardiovascular system. Um, it transports fats, but the biggest thing the lymph system does is your immune system fights off infection. Number seven is the respiratory system. The respiratory system includes your lungs, the bronchial tree, the trachea, your throat, your nose, and it functions to exchange gases. It takes air in and then moves oxygen into the blood and carbon dioxide out of the blood. So we inhale oxygen and exhale CO2. Number eight is the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system includes, of course, the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood, the pump, the tubes, and the liquid. And it functions to move things around so that things go to the right place, goes to the kidney to get cleaned, and blood moves from the digestive system with nutrients to the rest of the body. It helps to carry oxygen, uh, to all the tissues and waste out. Number nine is the digestive system. Lots of organs here. Hopefully you know some of these, right? Digestive system, your mouth, esophagus, stomach, intestines, etc. It functions to take food in and break them down into molecules that our cells can eat. Number 10 is the urinary system. This includes the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, for example, and it functions to remove uh, waste. It balances water and electrolytes. It helps maintain uh, pH. Um, and also, the kidneys can make some hormones, for example. And last, of course, we have reproduction. The reproduction system um, is the only one you can live without, but nobody wants to because that's the fun one, right? Anyway, the function of the reproductive system is to create offspring. So there you have the 11 uh, organ systems. Hopefully you have those written down and can kind of define them very briefly. Obviously, as we go through this class, we'll go through lots more detail about each one. So there's four things you need uh, to stay alive. Oxygen, pretty important. After about four minutes, if you don't have oxygen, you're pretty much dead. Obviously, you need food and water. Um, supposedly, you can live 70 days without food. I think that would be horrific. I don't think I could go seven hours, let alone seven days or 70 days. Water, um, you can die from dehydration very quickly. It depends a little bit on the environment, but you can't go more than a few days without water. You need some amount of heat. Uh, we would not function well in the Antarctic, for example. We, our bodies cannot keep us warm enough without protection from the elements. So we need some amount of warmth. And we live under atmosphere, uh, atmospheric pressure. We can't live on the moon. There's no gravity and pressure there. Uh, our bodies were made to survive in the pressure that is on Earth, and that is required for life. The characteristics of life, there are five. First one, organization. Most cells, tissues, etc., are arranged in such a way that they can function. Without that arrangement or that organization, they would not be able to do that. So without the organization, the cell is going to die. Life is very complex, so you need some organization to keep it all straight, just like in our own lives, I suppose. Number two, metabolism. Metabolism is all the chemical reactions that take place in a cell. All living organisms must do this because some of those reactions generate energy. And without that energy, of course, we would die. So all the chemical reactions that take place is your metabolism. And all cells do that. All cells are able to respond or adapt or when something is stimulating them, they, are, they have a response or a reaction. Okay, so the ability to adjust to these changes or to react to a stimulus, um, that is something that is characteristic of life. You do it and your cells do it. Number four, um, all cells or life has the ability to move. Sometimes it's physically move 
the cell or your parts, you know, pick up your arm, stomp your feet, etc. But also within cells, there is movement of nutrients, waste, etc. And cells that are alive have this ability. Last is growth and development. Without this, cells wouldn't be able to reproduce. Uh, they wouldn't be able to get bigger um, when necessary or repair themselves, etc. So if you have to decide if something is alive, these things, and some books uh, spread them out a little bit more um, or have more things here that fall under one of the five that I've listed, but all cells that are alive should be able to do these five things. Okay, the next part of unit one is homeostasis. And I'm gonna talk about this for the next several slides. And basically, it's the ability to stay normal. It's the ability to maintain a stable internal environment, which sounds really weird, but you wanna be normal. You wanna have a normal heart rate, a normal blood sugar level, a normal blood pressure. Everybody wants to be unique and cute and special. Yeah, your body doesn't want to be. Your body wants to stay at normal. And the ability of our body to do that, basically, if you fail to be able to do it or you can't do it, that's a disease or it's death. So if you can't maintain your body temperature at 98.6 or whatever your average is, there's going to be things that are going to go wrong and if it moves too far away from that 98.6 too hot or too cold you could die okay so when you don't have homeostasis you have disease or death and so we measure all these homeostatic measurements right we we measure body temperature heart rate blood pressure blood sugar etc uh, doctors do it you might do it at home uh, with a thermometer for example and if that number is not what average is you know there's something wrong so the body is wants no matter what number one job for a cell or your body is to stay alive and to stay alive you need to maintain homeostasis I don't know if any of you can do what that little dude's doing in the picture to maintain that kind of balance must take a lot of work and your body does this every single day, all this work to keep you at normal, and we don't even notice. So basically the homeostasis pathway is there's a stimulus, a sensor that detects that change, the control center, which is almost always the brain, figures out what that means, and then there's an effector that's gonna respond. So basically, that is a change in set point. So body temperature is the example I'm gonna use several times here. If your body temperature changes, receptors are gonna detect this, thermal receptors in the case of body temperature, right? That's gonna to go to the brain, uh, particularly the hypothalamus, and it's gonna be like, oh, you're too hot, or oh, you're too cold. And it's gonna send signals to the effector, which if it's too hot, the effector might be your sweat glands, and it will say open up because you need to lose some heat because your body temperature is too high. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what the set points are. We're gonna talk a little bit about the receptors. We're gonna talk about the control center, which is mostly the brain, and we're gonna talk about the effectors, which are always muscles or glands. So let's start with the set points. Set points are values that are considered normal and therefore what you want to reach for or what you want to keep your body at or if it's not, what you want to return to. Okay, so a change in set point is the first thing that your body's going to watch out for in order to respond to a change in that. Body temperature is supposed to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Blood pressure is 120 over 80. Your blood pH is supposed to be 7.4. Your resting heart rate should be about 72 beats per minute. And your blood sugar should range between 60 and 110 milligrams per deciliter. These five numbers you guys will have to know. You're gonna see them on the first test, you're gonna see, or the first lab quiz, you're gonna see them on the final exam. These five you should know. There are lots and lots and lots of set points. 
levels of blood calcium, for example, or serum triglycerides, or cholesterol, or whatever. But these five, we're going to talk about the most, and I think you should know them uh, leaving this class. Now, does it mean that every single person is at average? No. It's an average number, so probably hardly any of you are exactly at 98.6 degrees. In fact, when I take my temperature, I'm often 97.7. I don't know if that's my average or it's just always been a little bit low. Anyway, you should know that average body temperature is 98.6, average blood pressure 120 over 80, blood pH is 7.4, resting heart rate 72 beats per minute, and blood sugar should be under 100 or 60 to 110 is what a normal range might be uh, listed at. All right, so what detects these things? You have receptors in your body, sometimes inside, sometimes outside, all over the place that detect um, a change. They are proteins, okay, in nature, if you need to know the molecular structure of them, and they are labeled or named kind of by what they detect. So thermoreceptors, for example, detect changes in temperature. Osmoreceptors detect changes in osmolarity, which is essentially the concentration of stuff that's in the fluid. Chemoreceptors detect a change in a chemical. Um, there's also photoreceptors in your eyes that detect light, for example. This information from the receptors is sent to the brain um, or the control center, and mostly that is the brain. The brain takes that information and says, okay, if temperature is supposed to be 98.6, because it knows what the set point is, and the thermal receptors are detecting that it's 100, then you are too hot, and therefore I'm going to figure out how to make you cooler. I'm going to send that information out to uh, an effector, because the whole purpose here is to get you back to normal. So the effector is always a muscle or a gland. Usually the muscle, if it's a muscle, it's going to be told to do one of two things, relax or contract. And if it's a gland, it's going to be told the same thing, either open or close. Okay, so it's not too hard, but obviously if you're hot, you want your sweat glands to open, not close. Okay, and your brain, your control center, is going to be the one telling the effector what to do. Now, what do you do when you get back to set point? You don't want to keep sweating after you've cooled back down to the 98.6. You want to stop. And the ability to stop that response is called negative feedback. Basically what happens is kind of like your furnace in your house. You have a thermostat, you set it at 70 degrees, say. If that temperature falls below 70, your furnace comes on. But once it gets back to 70 and the thermostat reads that value, it sends a signal to shut your furnace off. Because you don't need the heat anymore, you've got it back to what you set it at. So negative feedback is just as important that you be able to turn the response off as it is to turn the response on. You want to sweat to cool, but you don't want to keep sweating. You'll get too cold or you'll get so dehydrated and lose so much fluid, you'll drop your blood pressure, which could kill you. Okay, so if your body temperature goes up and the thermos receptors detect this and the brain tells your effectors to sweat and to vasodilate, increase the uh, diameter of your blood vessels and move them towards the skin so you can radiate away more heat. That's why you look red when you're hot. Eventually, the temperature will come down and negative feedback will turn off that response. So sweating will stop, your vessels will go back to normal size or constrict again, and hopefully your temperature stays again at 98.6. So to summarize this, there's, there's a stimulus, a sensor that picks that up, or a receptor, a control center, usually the brain, and an effector, a muscle or gland, that will respond to get you back to set point. And once you do that, negative feedback will shut off that response. Okay, so hopefully you're kind of understanding uh, homeostasis 
if you want to watch this quick little video, remember to go back to the regular PowerPoint and you can click on this. It's a cute little video and it's not very long, so you should check this out. All right, so making sure you understand this, this might be a little bit of an application for you. Hopefully this PowerPoint has explained enough about homeostasis that you understand. Here's this little dude and he ran out in the sun and he is quite dehydrated. Okay, so the sensor, some receptor is going to pick this up, right? And the control center is going to figure out what to do, send information to an effector, and do what? So if you can think about the fact that you're dehydrated, what would your body do? And logically, hopefully this just, you know, comes to you because you've probably been dehydrated before. One thing that you're going to do is probably feel thirsty. That is going to induce you to go to the sink or the refrigerator, get a drink of water. Okay, and we don't even think about it because we just naturally go do this. But of course your body's going to want to go get, make yourself go get water. What else happens is that osmoreceptors are going to detect that your blood is suddenly more concentrated. There's less water, so there's the, the stuff in the blood or plasma is now more concentrated. Osmoreceptors will detect this. The brain triggers the feeling of thirst, which we just talked about, but also sends a signal to the pituitary gland to release a hormone called ADH. ADH is antidiuretic hormone, which basically tells your kidneys not to pee. It's going to tell your kidneys, hey, this person's dehydrated. You need to save water, not, ex not make more urine. So urine amount will go down. And you've probably noticed this too, right? After you've been outside mowing the yard or you went for a run on a hot day, you still urinate because you still got to get rid of some waste, but the urine is less and it's more concentrated. That's why it's a darker color yellow. Probably didn't want to talk about your pea color here, but this is exactly why that happens. Okay, so. What is homeostatic set point for body temperature? Okay, hopefully you said 98.6. How do we measure that? We use a thermometer and we can use, you know, one that goes in your mouth. They have infrared readers uh, in your ear, or on your forehead. Um, there's anal thermometers. There's all different kinds of ways we measure uh, body temperature. And we are going to do an activity in lab if you're in class, we'll be doing this in class. Basically, we're going to have you measure your body temperature at different times of the day and see if it changes a little bit because it actually is uh, something that varies from time of day. That's why always when you take your temperature or when a doctor does, they mark down the time as well. Okay, and does everybody have the same temperature? It'll be very interesting to see what happens um, different times a day and different people. Okay. If you are an online student, um, there's directions for this in your lab manual or your instructor has provided it because in your lab kit is a thermometer. If you're in class, you will be given one to do this. Okay. And we'll get the collect the data and uh, graph it uh, during lab. All right, the second part of this PowerPoint show is the anatomical terms. This will introduce you to the general terminology used in anatomy, including body direction terms, cuts, cavities, membranes, quadrants, and the body regions. Knowing these will help you learn the bones, muscles, and blood vessels in particular, but all of your coursework will be easier if you learn the anatomical terms presented here. All of these things are in your lab manual, so I will briefly go through these slides but mostly you need to go to your lab manual to learn these. So body directional terms are always referring to the body when it's in anatomical position. This little dude is in anatomical position. He's facing forward with his palms full or facing up and his feet are together. Okay, so all of these things are based on anatomical position. All right, the directional terms, I usually learn them or teach them as five pairs of words rather than 10 terms. 
and they are uh, listed here as the opposites. Anterior means towards the front, posterior means towards the back side of you. So your umbilical cord is anterior to your lower back. Superior and, in, and inferior are up and down. Superior is towards the top, inferior is towards the bottom. Okay, towards the toes, for example. Medial is towards a midline and lateral is away from that midline. Proximal is closer to the attachment point. So this is mostly gonna to refer to your arms and legs. Your elbow is more proximal than your wrist, for example. And your wrist is more distal than your elbow because it's further from the attachment point. Superficial and deep have to do with surface or internal. So your hair is more sup superficial than your skull, which is more superficial than your brain. So your brain is the deepest there. There's three cuts, sagittal, transverse, and frontal. Sagittal cuts you into right and left sides, S for sagittal, and sides. Transverse cuts you into tops and bottoms, T, transverse, tops and bottoms. And frontal cuts you into fronts and backs. Frontal is sometimes also called coronal. Okay, so these are the different planes they can cut you in. An MRI, you might have a sagittal, transverse, or a frontal MRI done, depending on what the doctor uh, wants to look at. All right, then there's body cavities. You have two main body cavities, dorsal and ventral. Dorsal is in yellow here and includes your um, brain and spinal cord or the cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. The ventral cavity is in red here and it includes um, basically from your neck down to your hips, the, uh, um, the thoracic and the abdominal area. The thoracic or the ventral cavity can be split into the thoracic and the ventral abdominal pelvic cavity by the diaphragm. So above the diaphragm are your lungs and your heart. Your lung area or cavities are sometimes referred to as the pleural cavities. And where your heart is, is the pericardial cavity. The abdominal pelvic cavity can be further split into the abdomen and the pelvis. And the abdomen it's going to contain like your intestines and your stomach and the pelvic cavity, mostly reproductive organs in the bladder. There are membranes around all of this stuff. And if you've ever gutted an animal or dissected an animal, everything's very slippery, hard to hold on to. That's because the membranes around all those uh, organs are serous in nature, S-E-R-O-U-S which is a fluid that reduces friction to zero, but it makes it hard to hang on to, too. Anyway, if the membrane is the one that touches the organ itself, it's called the visceral membrane. If it lines the cavity the organ is in, it's referred to as the parietal membrane. So the visceral member membranes touch the organs, the parietal membranes line the cavity it's in. So the parietal pericardium lines the heart cavity and the visceral pericardium touches the heart itself. The visceral pleura touches the lungs and the parietal pleura lines the cavities the lungs are in. And then the same thing with the gut organs, the peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum is surrounding the organs or touches the organs themselves. And the parietal peritoneum lines the gut cavity. They are all serous membranes, so they all secrete that fluid that keeps everything no friction because these organs are moving against each other. As food moves through or your heart beats or you breathe, the lungs, the heart, all of this stuff is moving and you don't want it to rub against something and get a blister like you would if you rubbed your hands together very very long. The quadrants is another way we sometimes divide just the abdominal pelvic cavity. This is not up in the thoracic cavity. Divides it into four parts, very creatively named the upper right, lower right, upper left, and lower left. <laughs> so not too hard to remember. 
the liver is mostly in your upper right. Um, on the left side is your stomach and spleen. The lower quadrants have intestines in them. Um, the lower right quadrant is where your appendix is. And last but not least, you have the body uh, anatomical terms. We have picked several that you need to know. This list of all the words that you need to know for all of the units is called your master list and it's in the first couple pages of your lab manual. But in unit one, or the first lab, these are the ones that you need to know. Palmer is the palm of your hand. Planter is the bottom of your foot. Cephalic is your head. Buckle is your cheeks on your face. Pectoral is your pec regions, upper chest. Umbilical is your belly button. Femoral is your, your upper thigh. Axillary is your armpits. Genital is the genital region. Frontal is your forehead. Nasal is your nose. Digital is your fingers. Lumbar is your lower back. Brachial is your upper arm. Occipital is the back of your head. Gluteal is your butt. Orbital is your eye. Pedal is your foot. Cervical is your neck. And otic is your ear. Okay, so start looking at your friends and naming those parts or even your dog. Practice your anatomical parts. So how do we use all this stuff? Um, this is what you'll see in charts and on medical uh, records, so everybody knows exactly what everybody's talking about. It's kind of the lingo that doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals use. And you'll see it on your own chart, or you'll see it um, when you start using it yourself. As always, the last uh, PowerPoint slide talks about where to get some more information. Don't forget to read your reading assignment. It is your textbook. Um, there's Quizlets created for each one of these units you can use to practice. There's a couple of websites there that might help you. Always check out your lab book and don't be afraid to contact your classmates or your instructor.